Let us go ahead and get ourselves started today. You are back for session three of 120C, 220C. Today we are going to continue talking about how we can use these programming languages to go through and control a lot of river geometry. And we'll sort of pick up where we left off last time in terms of thinking about how we can programmatically compute uh, different sorts of values we'd like our geometry to have based on all sorts of different mathematical conditions that we might want to try and impose. But we're going to sort of push ahead into thinking about really how we can create parametric families or adapt our families to get them more parametric control, or even create adaptive families, which are those families that have more than a single placement point where you can really deform the geometry to get it to conform to whatever sort of surface you'd like to go ahead and wrap it around. Okay. And what we're going to look at is how we can go through and really use some computed geometry to place the rivet elements. And I'll distinguish that from where we started up front. We have been going through and, oh, we kind of using some very simple geometry, like putting things on grids or just kind of grabbing things that uh, were geometry that we could find in Revit. This is really how we can, in the spirit of design assistance, start doing some mathematical work to go through and define the curves that would then help us place the geometry giving us an awful lot of control over uh, you know, just, uh, how we can go ahead and determine those things programmatically as opposed to so explicitly. Okay, so just to recap, we were last time. We started with the whole notion that the really the typical flow, that basically almost everything sort of works its way out as get something, compute something, and do something, and we'll continue to follow that pattern. Last time we were looking at all these different sort of ways of getting and putting different things. So we were placing elements by either going through and sort of choosing a Revit family type and then putting it at a specific point. Standard Revit families typically have a single placement point versus adaptive components where we give a collection of points because we want to go through and place things at all those different points. So it may involve a little work of kind of computing and aggregating together the points together in the right order for the placement. We then talked about how we either got things by selecting one or many from the Revit environment, or we can set the parameter values. We can set parameter by name. Something we haven't really played much around with to, to the, so far, but we will with today, is that we can also get parameters by name. So any element that's out there, we go ahead and get things, sort of a specific name parameter or location to really easy one. We'll use that to get. Okay. So we looked at placing things on a grid, placing those little boxes on a grid. We placed some adaptive components, so three-point trusses along some Revit curves. And we kind of created some parametric towers where we placed them oh, on basically a grid and then adjusted their heights based on kind of a sine wave calculation. So that's where we have been. Today what I want to start with is really just going back to the whole notion of doing the controlling of the Revit components to talk about the whole uh, practice of deciding the ripple on the ponds and how the attractor cubes, which is really you know, the origin for that practice exercise uh, works, how we kind of work with those things together. The attractor cubes right now as an example is only using sort of a simple distance, but then if you want to go through and factor the distance so it models more of a wave or a diminishing wave or something like that, how we could adapt that. Did anyone play around with the practice exercise? Okay, Andrew, did anyone else? Excellent. And as you went through it, uh, any insights, any uh, things you'd like to share, or did it sort of fall out pretty nicely, or we, yeah, how did it work for you? sort of help. It's this whole notion of, yeah, half of the battle is finding the right node to do the right thing and looking at trying to understand what are the different inputs to go through. Definitely. So I can sort of get explicit about that. I almost like to sort of keep a little running list of things that I know, like they're in your bag of tricks or something like that, because as you build up that list, it's a little bit easier than going back to the whole browser tree kind of constantly. So maybe we kind of keep track of that. How about you, Mr. Andrew? Like, how did it go from your perspective? I forgot that masses don't have default visibility for a while. Ah. So, so as you were trying to do it, they were just vis visible to yeah, you? Yes, invisible. And then eventually I turned that off. Oh, very oh, good. There's things. 
Very good. Actually, it's, it's kind of interesting. I, I'll, we'll look at it. Whether we do it with masses, which have the default visibility, or we could do it with any sort of just really any Revit element. It could have been like a generic element that was a cylinder or a box or something like that that would have visibility, you know, using visibility graphics. That would have worked too. Oh, okay. okay. So the Beatles actually work because they actually do have visibility by default, or at least visibility graphics. Okay. Let's go ahead. Let's open up the attractor cubes and then talk about how we can sort of, you know, how that one works and how we can modify it into being rippled on the pond. Because it actually is, it's, it's really the same underlying logic. It just sort of gets a little more complex. So if you want to follow along, please join us at example 3.1. Go ahead and confirm that it's available to you. I try to get it out there, but sometimes I miss some critical step. I think you'll find session three Dynamo examples out there. Was it changed to example 3.4? No, not that one. No. That's all, it's been the same. Let's kind of keep on moving them forward a little bit. Okay, so let me go ahead and go over to my environment. I'll start by opening the Revit file, the Revit file that just has all those uh, little cubes in there. A little bit of flashing around, but hopefully we'll get to what we need. Great. So we have our field of cubes kind of hanging around out here. And basically, these are all little mass objects. I think these are the mass objects. Let me kind of see what these guys are. It's just these little boxes. These boxes are, yeah, they're masses also. So again, if you can't see those, you can either go to visibility graphics and turn on the masses. Right here, or another way to do it is just under massing and site. When you do all this conceptual massing, you can't just go to temporarily override that and say show the mass forms on floors. The difference is that will only be a switch that can be turned on and off for visibility graphics. I guess it's an override, but visibility graphics is the underlying setting for the view. Okay. You can sort of see these boxes are already a little bit different shaped uh, in terms of being kind of fat over here on the left hand side and very skinny over there on the right hand side. Let's open the kind of dynamo script or the dynamo graph underneath this. And a little attractor cube logic. Funny error message back in there. I think that has, that's based on an error I got yesterday. <coughs> or any other example. I'm clear that. Let's see if I can get rid of that. Hmm. I might be able to. We'll figure this out. I'm not used to error messages showing up right in the middle of the screen. I can look at the, that for a second. This is kind of with my preview. My preview looks a little bit strange in here, too. That looks good there, but this is that like 2D view. Turn on the background preview. I don't know what's going on here. I'm like really torqued to a funny angle, or what's going on? Let's see if I can kind of make my preview show up again. Not, let me just close that out. Try reopening that. As you'll hear me say often in this class, it's just software. And software has bugs. And even that has a little bit of bug in it right now. I'm going to just reopen Reddit and be on the safer side. Okay, so we'll open up that Dynamo graph. Again, as we get started, it's gonna be these little cubes. If I was gonna do the ripples on the pond, all I'm doing is switching them over to a cylinder object instead. 
But the, it all starts with the notion of just putting together a grid, then placing these different elements on the grid, and then having a separate point, which is either what I'll call the attractor point, or in little practice exercise, we call it the pebble, that you would drop in there and somehow affect the behavior of those boxes based on the distance away. Okay, let's try that again. Open up my cubes. Once we have my cubes, I'll go to the add-in. Okay, that looks a little bit better. At least, okay, phew, that's a little better. Okay, in terms of basic logic, this actually worked out, oh, it's Forward. Let's just kind of review the big blocks. I try to break it up into those different chunks to make it a little bit easier. There's that whole notion of the X, Y, Z grid and creating all these points by coordinates. So going from 0 to 50 with a step value of 5, just go ahead and place all that. Okay. Um, doing the cross product of all that to ultimately go through and end up with a whole bunch of points. Okay. On the other hand, we have an attractor point, or you can call it the pebble. Okay, where it has an x and y location. Currently, I have the x and y location just wired to the same coordinates, so it'd be moving diagonally across the field. Okay, you need currently set at zero. If we wanted to, we could create a 3D grid and kind of do that, but let's just kind of go through and take a look at how this works so far. So basically, we are taking all those different points, we are putting this box shape out there, and hopefully creating a whole bunch of different boxes. Let's just take a look at this, because this is sort of might get to sort of where we got ourselves in trouble last time. Looks like I have a bunch of grid points. I have a list and a list and all that kind of looks good. When I come over here and place the family instances though, go through and create all the ones? No, it didn't create all the ones. It's actually created sort of a subset of that. What I'm going to do is flatten that list out a little bit based on sort of what we discovered last time. The deal is we have all these different points over there and each column of points or row of points is sort of in a list. What I really want to do is just put a family instance at each of the different points. I'm going to flatten it make it a flat list as opposed to kind of having it all consolidated that way. Once again, I think something has changed a little bit in various versions. But let me go ahead and where I usually find things like that is if I say list dot flatten, you'll actually find that. There's actually two flatten functions. I should warn you about that. There's list flatten, which lets you take a list and lets you reduce a number of levels from the list, like an amount. So out one or two levels. Another function that's hanging around that we don't use nearly as much, but we used to use, let's see if it's still here, is flatten. Okay. Flatten just flattens the list, but it doesn't give you any control. So it's going to just smoosh it all down to like a 1D list. Either one of those will work, either flatten by one or just say like flatten completely. Either one of those should have the same result. So if I take those points and I take the flattened list, let me go ahead and run that. You'll see now I have a single list that has, oh, let's see, let me zoom this up so you can see it a little bit better too. You see I have a single list of all 120 points in there. Okay. So now when I take that flattened list and I bring it in as the points and run that, you'll see I don't get a series of lists of objects. What I should be getting is actually just a single list of a whole bunch of objects in it. Okay, let's see if we get that guy out there. In this case, it's really just to get the behavior we want. There's always this thing, sometimes 
we, we just want to have the data flowing in in the right structure. And in this case, if we, if really each of those points are equal to each other, there's really no notion of breaking them into rows and columns for the purpose of placing because the things that we're going to place in every column and row are exactly the same. They're just flattening them out. It really is the list of 120 as opposed to, you know, there'll be other times where we care about it. But for now, and I think what we saw last time was that we had an error where it didn't place properly because it was trying to uh, place, uh, yeah, everywhere, but it only saw things as the first element in each list. Yes? Okay, well, let's go on back and see if we can figure out why. Let's go back, go back over to the left and figure it out. Okay, so let us start out here. Did you run anything yet? Give it a little run. Okay. okay. Do you have to run each time? Um, well, let's do this. How about, why don't we just turn it to automatic? That way you won't have to do it every time because we're not working with so much geometry that it's messing us up. Go down here where it says manual down in the corner. And just choose automatic. And now it'll always be updated. Eventually that'll bother you. Let us take a look. There's always something. What we got? Okay. You're automatic. Come on. Oh, oh no, you're fine there. You're flattening it. Although, let's see, list oh, for list flatten, if we use that, then we're gonna have to put in a number of degrees of flatten it. So we'll put in like put a code block in that has one in it, and we'll take out one level of flattening. So I use just flatten without the oh, okay. okay, so let's put a one in there. Okay, now drag that over. What it's actually telling Dominique is it says, ooh, you've got a single function argument here. Is there a single function list? Okay. Okay. What's happening is if you have a, an object, some sort of node, and there's an open hole, it'll say, hey, that must be a function where you're going to feed me different values into the open hole. And that's what it's basically telling you there. So that's how I knew that there must be an open mm -hmm. hole somewhere. Okay. Take the one in and bring it into the amount. Okay. Now you're fine. Okay. Good. Yes, sir. What's that? So, um, we're just making the flattening to make sure that the point, the, the cylinders are on the, the correctly placed in the grid. Yes. And what is it happening? Is that is that a possibility that it happens without flattening? Oh yeah, it's. I tried it without flattening. It didn't work. Out. Oh no worries. If, if they're showing up, I wouldn't worry about it. It's just somehow, sometimes it gets confused by that. Okay. I just want to make sure. Yeah, I think the, the more proper way is to do the flattening. And for you, you got the points coming straight across. Go ahead and flatten. Take the flat list of points across. <coughs> Excellent. And try, try taking it out. You'll see the difference. Take it without flattening it. All right. Just uh, go from point to over here. And you'll see what you're going to get is a list where there's a single item in each list. The, like uh, many, many lists with single items in each list, whereas if you take the flattened, you'll just get a single list that have all of them in it. Okay, and for many things, it won't matter. For some things, though, it'll start to be very critical because it won't pair up properly. It's not flat. Okay, so we do this with our box shape. That's why our box shape back over in the background is kind of looking over there. Actually, you'll see even in here what's going on. It's, uh, I think it's probably a little bit odd about where it is. Take that out. That's another delete the previous one. Yes. That's an always. Okay. Next up, I got these big old boxes. These big old boxes are a little bit large in terms of what's going on. So if I wanted to go through and start, as opposed to having them all be 50 by 50 by 100, controlling their size, I can go ahead and just pull these elements over and kind of set their height and width to be much smaller. So for example, if I take the <laughs> families, and I say, let's take them over to a set parameter by name for the width. That's the brother, right? The width. What's that? Yeah. The width and the length. Yes. Those are the parameter values over in Revit. 
So how you can tell which ones are available is if you choose the object <coughs> over here, it's just the width and the length, whatever parameters are available there. Now, here, when I have my set parameter by name, it still won't be happy yet because it wants some sort of value in there for that. Okay. So what I'm going to want to do is put in some sort of value. Oh, I'm just going to put in a value of 1 for right now. So that's going to say basically take all of those uh, boxes and give them a width of one. But I want to also change them so that their length is also one. I would just also send them down there. So now I should have a whole bunch of little skinny one by ones. If you prefer to do this as opposed to with boxes, you want to do it with a cylinder or something like that, all you got to do is make sure you have the cylinder family loaded. Let me see if I have it loaded in here. Looks like I don't have it loaded in my example, but if I wanted to do that, oops, I just accidentally changed it to the stair step, is I'll come back over here and the list will always include whatever I have as families in Revit. If I need to insert a new family in Revit, I'll say, let's go ahead and load in a family. And, oh, they have all sorts of different things under the mass shapes. You'll find the cylinder, cones, boxes, really whatever it is you prefer. If you want to put desks or RPC beetles in, that's fine. And then as I go through and change it to use cylinder, the parameters may be a little bit different. So you'll see if I go over to my cylinders as opposed to the boxes, looks like I have radius and height deployed a little bit. So I can again sort of change radius and height to be whatever I want. Again, it is very specific, so yeah, including the casing. So if you want it radius. Okay, and right now I'm currently just setting them to ones and ones. But we're going to change that a little bit. Let's just kind of get them hanging around for now. Okay, you got a bunch of uh, like little cylinders hanging around in there? Mm -hmm. Not yet. Let's take let's, our boxes. Either way, well, let's see what we got. How are when things aren't working? What you got? No worries. Let's, let's slow down and get you caught up. Okay. So if you want to bring in the other part, what we're going to do is we're going to load in the family. We're going to load in the family called a cylinder. Okay, so insert, load in the family. Go on down to the mass families, and let's grab the cylinder. Excellent. So it's there now. Look back down to here to the dynamo script. Got it. And we'll change it to be the cylinder instead. Um, super. Now, when it does this, it may complain at you and say that, hey, cylinders don't necessarily have a width to them. Okay. So what they're going to have is a radius and a height, capital radius. Try taking out the space too. We'll give it a value for the radius. Go ahead and like uh, put in like just one. Okay, and drag that over to the value. Excellent. Now let's go back back to your uh, the graph in the background see, or the, the Revit environment. Super. So now you got a like a lot of radius one ones. If you want to change the height, now you can change the heights. Actually, we're gonna you can change it to one for now. We're gonna change it to something different. Okay. Do you have If they're in the Revit file, you shouldn't have to reload them. Okay, but in a new, in a new 
Also taking out the space at the back. I think the space, the movie has carriage are in there. Okay, there we go. And um, height is the other one. So capital height. How are you doing, Don? Good. I need to look at my Sure. Although now we have to go through and change the parameter name. Oh, the height. Capital height. You can hear when cut up. I understand. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> we have our heights. We have our grid. These are always sort of like a, this is pretty much the attractor there. Let's go back to the script and how about this? We have another point hanging around, which is the attractor point. You're just kind of hanging out there. What if we actually put in something there that we could actually see the attractor point? The attractor point is currently it's just some numbers, the x and y for the number. You can maybe be able to see where the attractive point is right now, but it may be hard to see, or maybe hard to see the pebble where it is right now. So if we wanted to go through and put in, say, a sphere at that point, let's talk about how we do that. Okay. So always beg, borrow, and steal from things you know. Okay. There is this family and family instance by point. Okay, so if I want to put a sphere in there at a point, it's probably going to be something very similar to that over there. So, in the spirit of begging, borrowing, and stealing, go up there and grab that if you want to. Just a little copy action, wouldn't be too bad, and paste. And what we are going to do for the point, I'm going to just take the attractor point coordinates. And for what it is that should look like that, oh, what can I do over here? Pull that down. Let's see if I have the sphere loaded. If I don't have the sphere, let's see if I have a sphere. I can't seem to type very well today. Looks like I don't have the sphere in there yet. So, in the spirit of uh, loading in things you don't have, actually, you can, I think you can see one of the little points. We have tractor points kind of hanging around right there right now, but we'll see. Let's go out and load in a sphere. So I'll go out to my masses. Again, it doesn't have to be a mass. That's just a type of family. If you want to bring in an RPC beetle and drive it around through your cylinders, that'd be <laughs> fine too. A little bit of a sphere. Okay, so now I can say, let's assign that point to the sphere. Hmm, looking a little large, <laughs> as pebbles go. So what do we have here? Sphere has a parameter called radius, so again, if I set the element parameter by name, and then uh, give it a smaller radius of like one or something like that or two, it may be a little bit easier to see. So not too bad. I'll come back over here. And I'll do that. Again, I can borrow and steal, but I'll just throw it from scratch right here. Element set parameter by name. So I'll take the element across. For the parameter name, 
I'm going to put radius in there. Here's a nice thing about code blocks. Code blocks really are very versatile, so you can put a lot of functionality in them. If I type radius in there, although if I want it to be considered to be a string, what I'll do is I'll put it in quotes. That is really the same as saying the string function and putting it in there. It's just kind of a short cutty way. Code blocks, just if you like to type, are often easier than pulling together a lot of separate little functions. Then for my value, I can put it on a slider or something like that. I'm just going to put in there a radius of two. Again, every different value that I put in there just gets separated by a semicolon. When I hit the big old return, oops, click out there, I should say. The radius is that, the two is going to that. So code blocks you're gonna find are just, they're kind of a shortcut. You could always do it the longer way. But they're kind of very handy. Okay, so I have my big old pebble hanging around over there. There it is. So it's uh, not doing too much for me right now. It's just kind of hanging out. But if I went through now and try changing okay, the slider, you can sort of see the pebble moving through the field. <laughs> so, so far, so good, except for the fact that like, nothing's really responding to that pebble moving on down through the field. So the way we want to adjust that is as follows. In the attractor logic, what we do is we just compute the distance between the pebble or the attractor point and the other points. So that's where we have this funny little function, which is really this geometry distance here. We'll take any two objects and just compute the distance between those centers. Super. So pull those together. You'll see between here and here, there should actually be a big old list of differences. We'll see. Actually, I'll do a little kind of adjustment on this, because you see it's a list of distances within the list. What I'm actually going to do is pull the flattened list of points in instead, because that will actually be, I think, a little bit cleaner in the geometry. So as opposed to the hierarchical list, I'm just going to pull in the flattened list. Okay, now I have a single list of differences. Okay. Now, this funny thing over here, this division factor, could be a multiplication factor. It's really just something, what you put in there is really going to just sort of say, really, what is the behavior you want to have based on the distance? So, if, let's think about this. If, as you get further away, you want things to be big, okay, and you're close in, you want things to be small, Okay, you would multiply by something. If you want to have the opposite behavior, if you as you get closer to it, you want things to get big, okay, and as you're farther away, you want things to get small, okay, then you divide by something. So it's really just a question of you want things to get bigger or smaller. Do you want to be an attractor or somehow being close to you makes you bigger and better, or are you a pillar, whereas I get closer to you, you try and get away from it. It's one or the other, it's just you know, one pattern or the other. So this function over here, we can either multiply or divide. Right now, if I'm dividing, that says that as I get closer to you and I'm dividing through by some number, what's going to happen is the closer I am, what is it? The bigger the factor, the bigger the effect of uh, like a, a kind of a repulsion. If it was one, it would not make a difference. But let's go ahead and leave it as uh, divided by right now. So what? What is double? Oh, this is um, a double uh, like precision real number. So there's integers, and there's real numbers, and there's single precision and double precision. That just means it carries more degrees of like uh, like decimal points, like off to the right hand side. So. I got these numbers computed. Let's go ahead and actually use these numbers to do something. So for example, right now I have the radius of this. That's all fine. I have oh, some sort of computation here. If I wanted to 
sort of simulate these old pebble run pond scenario, I might go ahead and adjust the height of the cylinders based on the distance. Okay, so I would take that distance and I would bring it across. And as opposed to putting in a value of one, I'd use that as the value for height. So let's just take a look at that and see what that looks like. Now, as I do this, notice it took a little bit longer to compute because it's got like a hundred and some odd little pieces that it has to recompute the height on. Okay. You'll see what's happening here is as I am very close, the heights are very small. As I am further away, the heights get bigger. And now, <coughs> using this dynamic system, if I go through and slide that pebble somewhere else, this is where you may not want to have it set to automatic because every time you change, it's going to go through and sort of regenerate all that geometry, which takes a long time. Okay, so. Let me just take it over here. I'll say, oh, what's my value over there? Let's say 25, 25. You'll see as it moves the pebble over. Yeah, go ahead and ask. Um, I'm getting another error with the set parameter by name. Let us check it out. Okay, we got a set parameter name. You got a, this is the cylinder coming here. It's a sphere. Yeah, it needs to be in the name. Oh, yes. Oh. Raise in the quotes to make it a string. Fantastic. And then for take the second one and bring it as the value. There you go. Beautiful. And now let's try that. Excellent. Yes. Um, it's not I think that would actually take the same thing. Try taking that to drop. I think that should make the same difference. Will do. And what's it say? No function calls on a Revit element family instance. So it's interesting. Okay, because it's looking for a piece of geometry, not a Revit element. So what we could do is we could say take that Revit element and get its location. Its location would then be a piece of geometry. It's and then the point that we created. Exactly. Okay. Which is coming on back or just pulling the point across. So it's interesting, that particular function, what you're doing makes perfect sense, but we just have to sort of abstract to the level from the Revit element to the geometry that defines it, because that only knows how to work with geometry, not the actual element. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you're onto a really good function you wanted to find was, I'd like to give you two elements as the two pieces of geometry, and do that. So take the value across. Beautiful. Okay, let's go back and see how you look over in Revit Land. Yeah. Woo! Okay, excellent. Fantastic. Now, the only variation, you know, where this got difference in the ripples on the ponds that are practice exercises, this is the classic practice. This is the, hey, just based on how far you are, like, you know, you drop a state bomb in the center of the city, whatever you're doing, and based on how things are radiating out, you sort of see what the blast radius is. You sort of see how closely things are affected. It's good for all sorts of things in physical simulations, particle physics, there's all these things that either attract or repel, or you can sort of see really how closely, you know, or what things are most impacted by you being around. Where the ripples on the pond got a little bit different, we said, hey, what if we wanted to take that distance? And we said, as opposed to it just sort of being this linear relation coming away, what if there was actually more of a wave kind of based on the distance? Okay, and that's typically what sort of happens in the case of dropping pebbles on the pond. Let's kind of think about that. So, 
So I got some nice water up in here. Okay, I'm gonna go through and drop my pebble kind of right over there at the point of impact. So what is the effect of like putting, you know, dropping a pebble into a pond? What happens on the surface of the water? Yeah, you start to get ripples. Let's think about that. What happens right where the uh, thing drops down? It, it probably is going to depress it a little bit right there. But then it'll start rolling off. Yeah, kind of like a sine wave. But maybe off. Yeah, but heading out in all directions. So what we can do is think about the distance and then kind of based on the distance. So that's the point of impact. And this is the distance. Okay. We can go ahead and say, hey, let's go ahead and take the sign of D and then adjust the heights based upon, you know, not just D, but sort of the sign of D. Now, the problem with just using sine waves is since they are sort of centered around zero, you get negatives, you get positives. So what we have to almost do is go through and add up into it just sort of the base height of the water. Because the value of the height won't be zero. It will be based on sort of whatever you consider the surface of the pond is. So if back in here, If that height right there is really what I'll call the depth, what I want to do is add that in. Because I want it to be plus or minus from that sort of standing depth of the water. So the most common thing we do with sine waves when we're working with geometry is we just have to have the depth in. Just make sure that we don't go less than zero because cylinders that are less than zero just rather gets very unhappy about. Beyond that, it's all just sort of gussing it up to sort of uh, give you more control. For example, some people like to do this. They'll go through and say that, you know, I don't necessarily like to go through and just have this wave standing this way if I'd like to amplify it, I can make it taller and make it more dramatic. Maybe you dropped it in with a lot, you hurled it in with a lot more force. Okay, That's what I'd call an amplification factor. And if you want to put that in there, what we typically do is just multiply the amplification factor so that all the values we haven't really shifted them. We're just multiplying it to amp it up, either amp it down or amp it up. So we put the amplification factor in. So classically, the formula looks sort of like sine of the distance times an amplification factor. Okay. The final thing, and we won't belabor this one because I'll let you guys play with it on your own some more. Got to keep on working with it. Is you could say that hey, for the amplification. What if it isn't just sort of a kind of static wave that kind of keeps on going out, but that the further we get away, it starts to diminish a little? That's usually what happens on a pond. Okay, so think about this. We can take the sine of the distance, and how could we take this formula? How could we take that formula and have it diminish as it gets further away? What can we do to that formula mathematically to say that the bigger the distance gets, the smaller the number wants to get? Yes. Okay, you can do that. So you take the distance that you could compute it, and then you either divide it or multiply it depending on what you want to do. Yeah. So the, the most classic thing to do, as Angad suggests, is something like this. And again, there's any number of ways you do that, would just be to take this whole thing and divide it by the distance. 
because that way, as you're very, very close, the effect is stronger. The further out, just the, the weaker and weaker it gets. So the idea is, could we go through and implement something like that like as a formula? Okay. And you can. <laughs> and that's actually the cool part about this. So it's really the base height, sine of the distance, times an amplification, divided by some dampening factor, or so now the distance. Okay. So let's go ahead and see how that actually works back in uh, the dynamo land. Okay. We've just been sort of playing around with these things. If we wanted to go through and create a formula that looks something like that, the distance is kind of really right up in there. And we're dividing through to get our heights right now. Let's do something else within here. It's a little bit different. Okay, so let's go ahead and just set up ourselves with a code block because we can sort of define this thing just the way we want it to. So let's say that we want to do the sign. I think it's math.sign of the distance. Okay, that's going to give us that. Okay, we're going to go through and say we're going to add to it the base height. Okay, let me show you what this part does. If I just do that, what I'm going to get is a little formula that's going to have two inputs, the distance and the base height. Super, and it's going to give us an output. So we can take the distance and feed it in. We can give it a base height and feed that in. And it's going to get some sort of value in there. So I can take my distance from my base height. You can decide whatever you want it to be. Oh, it's going to be a 5. Then would you have to convert that into degrees? Um, well, it depends on how you want it to be interpreted. You can multiply it by something to sort of get it to be interpreted as degrees. Correct. Yeah. Right now, by, de by default, it'll assume the number is degrees. Okay, so we may need to uh, multiply it out a little. In fact, here, if I come over here and you see the sine function, it assumes that it's going to be the degrees. Okay, so we might need to multiply it out a little bit to go ahead and like, uh, you know, actually see the wave because if it's a very small distance, you, you may or may not sort of see it. The other way to do it is you can go ahead and take it and do it as radians. So there's a function also, let me come over here and show you what the radians function looks like. Radians two degrees. So if I want to go through and take that distance and treat it as a certain number of radians, what I can do is put another function right within there. Say math.radians. and I'll give it a base height over here. Let's see what's going on here. I'm still messed up somehow. Can I start a method construction math radians? Two degrees. That's what it is. Now what's it saying? Can I find a static method? Math sign. <laughs> What are you not liking about? Well, could it be that I have miscapped it? Okay. So now you start seeing some different values here. So if I just want it to be the sine wave, now I have the first part where I have the base height, and now I can bring those in as the values. Okay. I can just kind of keep on making this as complex as I want. And that's sort of a very common <laughs> thing we end up doing is just doing a little bit of math. Kind of, kind of mess around with it. Math and sine wave functions are a very common one. To kind of sort of play around with. So I can take that in and say, but I want to pull that in as the value for the heights as opposed to just the distance. Okay, 
Okay, let's see what that looks like. And then I'll leave this example because it's a fun one. You can kind of keep on playing with it. Let's see what I got in here. Yeah, I may not be able to see. They do vary with which one, but. What's that? They need that amplification factor. Yeah, I need that amplification factor to really see it. I think that's an excellent suggestion. So let me go ahead and say I'm going to multiply all that times my amplification factor. I'll put all that in parens just because I want to make sure all that gets parened before I do that. Okay, and I can put, oh, even here, this is where it gets kind of fun. You can put an integer slider in there or something like that. I'll just put a number in there. Let's try it with a factor of five. Okay, that should be much more pronounced. Interesting. Now, there's another factor you could throw in here too. There's this whole notion of the frequency, which is the distance between the different waves and troughs. You can sort of see with my amplification of 10, it's really a, a five. It's a little bit too extreme there. Let me pull that back out. Let's give it an amplification of two. But if you want to control the distance between the troughs. Okay, can you see? Let's see how far my troughs are apart from each other right now. They're kind of okay. It looks like I'm sort of at a, a high spot, a low spot, a high spot, a low spot. The other thing you can do is you can put in a frequency of the wave, and you typically do that by dividing. So the bigger that becomes, what is it, it, it's really, it has a way of like compressing the distance, not, not adding or not compressing or expanding the sign of it, but the distance itself. That brings the waves even closer or further out. Again, just play with this one. It's really, you know, it's just kind of interesting, fun things you can do with sine waves. I mean, it's only for some reason doing it with the first set of points, like the first. Ah, now, do you, did you, are you flat, are you bringing flattened points, or what's going on? Yeah, so I think that this is the thing, I think we saw it last time when Andrew sort of discovered that, oh, it was only in there, and it was only because of the shortest or the longest. Try bringing flattened points in, and I think you'll get the right behavior. Okay. Now, Let's go ahead, though, and because the attractor logic will sort of work and it'll kind of do its thing, that's fine there. Yeah. Let's go ahead and look at this whole notion of the whole sine wave thing in a slightly different example, though. You know, one that I think is actually kind of a fun other way to look at doing waves, and that is looking at windows. <coughs> okay, let's talk about what we're going to do in this second example, because it's also going to do this whole sine wave thing. We're going to use that whole sine wave function, put in a wave baseline, a wave amplitude, a wave frequency. That's all the same. Nothing's going to change there. We're going to do something based on the sine wave. But what I'm going to do is actually get a series of window locations, okay, and then somehow compute either their height or their size or something at them based upon the sine wave and sort of where they're located on the wall. So, I'm going to go ahead and get something, then compute something, and finally adjust the windows okay, uh, based on their sine wave values. And let's go ahead and start where I will differentiate this from some of the other things we've done. We've been going through and going, uh, putting a lot of grids in place and dropping things at grid locations. This is kind of almost the inverse a little bit. We're going to assume you have a building and there's already windows on the face of the building. Okay, and we're going to grab the element. So it's kind of like what you were asking about, you know, can I just get the element itself as opposed to uh, getting the geometry? Because we're going to use the uh, location function, and we use this location to pull the point out of the element as well as the other way around. Okay, so go on over if you can. 
and open up. Goodbye, Mr. Sine Wave. Okay, we're going to open up instead 3.2. fixed windows that are all kind of riding around at about the same height. You know, it's like a lot of buildings you see today. Like this is one of the first examples I first started playing around with uh, some in class that I wanted to, for the D prep class, have something that would sort of follow a sine wave. There must be some way to do that. And there is. Okay, so I got all these different windows in there. The special thing about windows, what's interesting about windows in general is they're kind of hard to place using Dynamo. It's easy to grab them and move them, but it's kind of hard to kind of create them because they don't really have an absolute location. They have to be hosted in a wall. So you have to sort of say, here's a wall, and there's a window on the wall. Okay, but they do have a location once they are placed. But let's just kind of talk about how we get at it. So again, what I'm going to do is I am going to get the location of all these windows. After I get the location of all those windows, I'm going to go through and say, hey, based on the x in your location, go through and compute some sort of value that looks like a sine wave. And then based upon that computation, maybe reset the height of the windows, a sill height, or it could be the size of the windows. It could be all sorts of different things. So let's go ahead and check it out. If you come over and go to the add-ins, open up Dynamo, and go to 3.2. And I'll open up A. No worries. This gets me it's about all the time you take a break. We'll do it in a second. Let's look at this big old script because in some ways it's not all that different from things you've seen. Here's a new function for you. Okay, we have family types and we've been using that function. That is, okay, for the family, that's all, you know, just tell me this is a family. We've done select element. We've done select elements. We're going to get several things and you explicitly select either one or you select several or something or whatever. All elements of family type <laughs> gives you all the different things throughout that family. Okay, so it's another way of selecting as opposed to me going after it and manually choosing and control clicking to grab them. It's just going to say grab all of the different elements of that type. Okay. And if you give this one a run, I'm going to set it to auto. And I actually do a little watching. All Elements doesn't actually give you the uh, kind of little turn down preview. I have to watch it if I want to see them. You'll see I have a whole bunch of elements. I have all these different windows. They're all 12 by 48 windows. They all have these little unique identifiers. Everything in Revit has a little unique identifier. We don't usually see that number, but that's how Revit actually thinks about it in this database. And what we would like to do is just get the location of all of those different elements. So there's a fantastic function called family instance location. Let's go ahead and just take a look, though, and sort of see what other things we can get about a family instance. <coughs> so if, I, if you give me an instance, what can I actually find? Okay, I can find out what type it is. What is it? I can find out its location. I can set its rotation. I'm just going to do the coordinates. But, you know, we're just going to pretty much go through. Actually, even here, I should point out in this little browser how this is organized. You'll see that, like, when it says family instance and has a little question mark, that's a piece of information. You can query and get that information. The plus means I can add a value to it. Okay? 
that we create a family instance site point. We've been doing that a lot. We've been placing them at points. Family instance location, something I can pull. It returns a family instance object that's represented by a specified moment. Hmm. Interesting. There's a little calculation in there. Okay, but we're just going to go for location. So if I want to get the location of a bunch of those things, I can pull on down. And you'll see I'll get a whole bunch of x, y points. Just sort of preview back in the background. If you want to try other things, let's see if we can get the wall. I don't have any ballisters in there right now. Actually, no, walls aren't family instances. They're, well, no, they're, uh, they're system families. So I think about the only thing I have in here that I can really get right now is this window. If I get one of the other sizes, you'll see it's an empty list because there's none of those family instances placed. The only ones that we have out there are these 12 by 48s. Yeah. There's all their X, Y locations. So given that you have all these X, Y locations, you have a bunch of points. You might say, well, what if I only want the X or I only want the Y? And that's what this next part is. It's for any point, we can pull off the X or the Y by saying point dot X or point dot Y and pull those values out. So you'll see that all my different values have the same Y. Right now, this is because that wall is kind of located in the same Y location. <clears throat> okay, the X has changed a little bit. You see, that would change a little bit, though, if I came over here and I, like, for example, rotated my wall. Let me rotate that. Okay, I think now if I go on back, you'll see that the... Uh, The Y's are a little bit different. But if what I'm interested in doing is pulling those X locations, I'm just going to say point X. Double is a sort of the precision of the number. Okay. So I think what this is going to give me is just those first parts. It's going to give me the 17, the 15, the 12. Again, mine probably look a little bit different than yours right now because I rotated that thing. Let me undo that. Then I have my new x values. So we have all those x values. And at some level, if you would like to compute some sort of wave out of those x values, have we got a function for you? And it's really the same thing we've been doing. I have down in this block at the bottom here two different ways of doing this. I have a slider for the frequency. That's how closely together to have the troughs, the wave amplitude, just how broad that's going to be. And the base height, that's just raising the whole thing up or down. Okay, different inputs for that. And really it is the value, radians, degrees, the sine, multiplying it times the amplitude, then adding the base height. Okay, so that's sort of what we did before. But if you prefer, you can just use this code block, which has all that stuff squished together. Yeah. Those two things should give you exactly the same answers. So if I take those x's and either pull them into this function, or if I take those x's and pull them in here, but I still have to hook up the frequency, the amplitude, and the base height. Just use whichever way you feel more comfortable doing it. And let me kind of comment on code blocks in general. You know, for a long time, I did it this way because it was very clear, very explicit. It was you know, kind of easy for me to spot what was going on. If using code blocks and stringing them all together feels very alien and a little uncomfortable, just keep on doing it this way. There's no real computational advantage. It's really just whatever you prefer. So use whichever one feels more, more comfortable to you. If this feels like boring, and oh my god, I have so many nodes, I can't deal with that, and you just prefer to type code, use that way instead. But they're both the same. Let us do this. Let us take a break ever so briefly. Please, come on back if you can, in about five minutes, something like that. Come on back, and I'll stick around and sort of, if anyone
anyone's having troubles, kind of try and get you out of troubles. But it's pretty much, yeah, we're gonna compute some values out of this whole thing, and then we're gonna next go ahead and adjust all the heights based on that. But if you wanna stick around and ask questions, that's super. Otherwise, go take a break and come on back. There you go.